must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support. And now for the show. Joe, I'm going to actually ask you this one first because, you know, apart from, you know, what you've mentioned already, what in your, in your view makes um, a clinical experience and an instructor top notch? Yeah, so I guess I set myself up pretty well for, for this one. Um, I think if you're in a setting that you're really interested in, uh, that's, that's the number one. Uh, my mother-in-law happens to make an alleged world famous coconut cake. I've never tried it. I hate coconut. It doesn't matter how great this cake is. I'm not going to enjoy it. That's, that's going to be, you know, uh, a peach clinic for me. I just, I know I don't want to practice in that environment. That's, that's not, that's not for me. And so it could, it could be the best instructor, you know, within that realm. And it's just not going to be, you know, the right fit. So I think you have to be in an environment that you find exciting or enticing And then it's that connection with your instructor. You might not always have to see eye to eye, but you should be able to have engaging, you know, back and forth conversations uh, and just kind of exploring, you know, you as a student, how you're, you're learning, you're developing just candid conversations back and forth, I think is, is the most important thing. Cause I know I've changed, you know, in practice patterns and confidence and, and things so much over these six months that without that flexibility and fluidity, I wouldn't have had nearly the development that I've had. Yeah, no, I can only imagine. And that seems to make a lot of sense. And Lauren, I'd love to kind of hear, apart from what you've kind of mentioned, what are your also thoughts on what makes a clinical education experience and clinical instructor top notch? Yeah, to go off what Joe was saying with the the coconut cake analogy, it's really relative to the individual and that instructor. It it just happened to be that me and Joe and Don just had a really great relationship and connection that, you know, even with someone who was really good, maybe maybe we don't have as much of a personal connection. So um, it's really just about, yeah, who who do you like? Who do you want to spend time with? For sure. And and Don, you know, seeing is how, of course, you had mentioned some of this in kind of one of the earlier answers regarding, of course, um, being an effective clinical instructor. Um, I'd love to kind of know a little bit more in depth on your insights into what makes um, a clinical instructor top of the line. I think it's a very hard thing to objectify. Um, so I, I know that for me, I was driven by a desire to give my students the absolute best experience and the best platform to learn on as I could. And so it reminds me of a quote by Benjamin Franklin, tell me and I forget, teach me and I may remember, involve me and I learn. I think a lot of being a good clinical instructor has to do with autonomy, giving your student the appropriate amount of autonomy so that they're, I say this a lot to students, you know, the two things that you will fail, you know, on my clinical over is safety and professionalism. If you lack those two things, you, there's going to be consequences for that. But outside of that, there's a couple of concepts that I think are really important. But ultimately, I want to give my students the appropriate amount of freedom so that they can think on their own. They can make decisions. They can problem solve. They can have human patient interactions and don't feel like I want them to be my replica or automaton. I'm not interested in replicating myself and Joe and Lauren. I'm interested in helping them to grow uniquely in their own way. So I think it's a really unique combination of skills. I think you, you need to have the, 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 the knowledge and the abilities that uh, back to the idea of proficiency, clinical mastery. But I also 
also think that you know, need to have that humility, the humility enough to say, hey, I don't have to be front and center. I spent a lot of the last six months teching for Joe and Lauren. I spent a lot of time sitting behind them and, you know, not being front and center or, you know, in fact, the, over the last week, uh, Joe and Lauren have both gotten so many gifts from patients, um, you know, different little, you know, things that, that, that patients were excited to give them and gift them because they were their primary providers. And so getting patients to understand that we're working as a team, that I'm a, I'm a teaching clinician. Uh, you know, interestingly, I've heard a lot of uh, uh, colleagues say things, especially folks in cash practice, talk about how they can't take students because they don't feel like uh, they can get their patients comfortable with the idea. I personally have never really struggled with that. I've just in integrated students into uh, the, the kind of the practice pattern, and they have uh, interaction with with the patients and if they have a have a really good idea or they have some value to offer then uh, by all means go right ahead and uh, if you can help this person better than I can then I'm then I'm all for that so I, I really think that the humility uh, aspect is really 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 important well absolutely and I think you brought up so many good points along with that of course mentioning that you know I love that quote that you had mentioned of course involve me and I learn really fostering autonomy and really helping those students be themselves. Um, you know, but I'm going to expand on that a little bit because, Don, based on what you've learned, not only from experience, but from reading more into this, so including books, research, and the whole nine yards, what, you, in your view, has been the most effective and game-changing points or lessons that you've learned when it comes to fostering effective learning for students in the clinic? Like anything else that you can think of to add on to that? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with, with patterns both your thought patterns and your practice patterns. And so I think it starts with establishing a respectful learning environment. I think that's really important. And that, that begins with this relationship building and trust development. I think you have to communicate your goals and objectives for feedback and then be engaged as a CI. And so doing, giving direct uh, observation and then basing your feedback on that observation. So you have to be engaged with your student while they're caring, whether it's, you know, giving, doing an evaluation, doing an examination, or just giving intervention. Uh, and then I, I also think that it's really critical that you give timely feedback and quality feedback that is going to uh, really help the, the, the student learn, um, you know, kind of what they're, what they're doing. And then finally, promoting the metacognition uh, that is required to to encourage students to be independent, autonomous learners. They have to do regular self-assessment. Uh, one of the things that I asked Lauren to do early in her clinical with me was to find a way to reflect and to have her own personal journal. She ended up purchasing an app, and she had a 30-minute or so commute, and so she would, you know, on her way to and from clinic, she would spend that time kind of decompressing and giving herself some opportunities to record her thoughts, you know, kind of live stream brainstorming about that. And then she'd come back the next day or a few days later and say, hey, I was thinking about this thing that you said, or I was thinking about that interaction. And so I think establishing these really healthy thought and practice patterns is really, really, really important. And then finally, the last thing I would, I would just like to kind of say is engulf all of that in optimism or positivity. I think that's so important that whenever someone is learning a new skill or they're in a foreign environment, it's hard. And even if you've been there for five or 10 or 20 or 50 years, it's still hard for your student. And so don't, as a CI, don't, don't forget how difficult it was. Like I remember being on my ortho clinical and I had never really worked in a PT clinic as a tech. And so I had never seen an old E-STEM unit that had the dial. And I was probably my first week there was uh, an older gentleman uh, with, you know, some modality, shoulder, stem, and heat or cold. I don't remember. But I, his bell rang, and I just was trying to be helpful. And so I ran over, and I grabbed his little old stem machine, and I flipped the dial. Like, I turned the dial really quick. And unfortunately, I didn't turn it the right way. I turned it up instead of down. And so my, this, this patient, who really wasn't my patient, he screamed out in pain. And I was so terribly embarrassed. And I just appreciate in that moment, I made this, this you know, mistake. And I, uh, I appreciated that my CI, and I remember this a lot, I, I appreciated that she, uh, she wasn't like super hard on me. It was just, it was, it was a mistake. I, I, I turned the thing the wrong way. 
And every time that I go to a stim machine to take someone off, we see a lot of high school athletes who come in, you know, for the bump and bruise clinic in the morning. And so every time I go to take someone off of a, off of a stim machine, I think about that and I go, which way does this dial need to go? You know, I, I need, I need it to go counterclockwise. I don't want to zap another patient. And so I, just the idea of putting all of that, all of these life lessons that we're trying to give our students into a positive framework and a positive environment, I think is really important. So Don, I, I'm kind of curious because one thing that, you know, of course we have to recognize I, in being clinical instructors is that, you know, the clinical pressures for outcomes to maintain relationships with referral sources, the clinic reputation, and sometimes depending on the setting and a few other variables, it can be challenging to kind of set up a safe space for a student to fail and learn with the risks of failure causing potential problems to the clinic. So how do you recommend to a CI kind of the best way to facilitate the best learning for the student, along with kind of avoiding potential backlash to the clinic? Like, how do we make the best of both worlds on this one? Because I could see how this could be, I could see how this could certainly be an issue for sure. Yeah, this question reminds me of uh, Jocko Willink's uh, book, Extreme Ownership. Th that's really my answer is anything that happens in your clinic under your license, you are responsible for. So if a patient has a really good experience and a referral source is happy, then I give all that credit to the student. I'm so happy for them. I'm so happy that they had a good experience, that they did good work, and that everyone, all the constituents involved are happy. If a patient is having had a poor experience or they're unhappy or a referral source is unhappy, I take ownership of that. That is my responsibility because back to this idea of optimism, I want my student to have a positive experience. That doesn't mean that I shield them from harsh feedback or you know some, some things that I think they really need to focus on to get better, but it's just... If, if there is a disgruntled or unhappy patient, then they need to talk to me. I confront them. I deal with that. I will call, you know, the referral source who's dissatisfied because I'm responsible for what happens under under my license and, and under my supervision. And so I, to me, that's the answer is, you know, it's not my not my role to blame the student. You know, they're a novice in this. You know, it, what does that say about me if I'm not passive or I'm not disengaged? And so I think a lot of CIs need to take ownership of that. And, and I think it needs to be extreme ownership over the fact that everything their student does, how they document, how they interact, how they make contact referral sources, they're learning that from you, whether you are directly or indirectly teaching them. And so I think that's the, that's the position of being a CI is you have such a great opportunity to uh, improve every person that that student goes off and treats for the rest of their career. You have, you have this like almost law of multiplication effect, but at the same token, there, yeah, there's some risks, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to say that I've never been put in kind of some awkward situations with students uh, who may have said or done things that, that I, you know, would not have maybe done it quite that way, but you know, that's my opportunity to, you know, that, that clean up and try to fix, you know, those, those, those situations. And, uh, practice my skills of diffusing and taking ownership. No, absolutely. I mean, I, that seems to make a whole lot of sense because, I mean, just given the complexities, and I'm sure it's a very, very dynamic dance because I know we had uh, Andrew Bennett on last year to talk about that, and he kind of developed this really kind of elaborate system and strategy that he kind of used kind of within the eval with the patient. And it was just really interesting because I never had would have thought of doing it that way, and if it, and it seems to work well for him. So I'm like, you know, that's great that that's one way to do it. You know, one thing we haven't talked about yet is probably uh, our favorite thing when it comes to clinical education, and of course, that's the CPI. Um, I would love to know kind of everyone's thoughts on the CPI as it stands now, so kind of looking at strengths, but also some constructive critiques to it. Um, Lauren, I'd love to kind of hear your insight first and then Joe, because, you know, from a student perspective, I'd kind of just like to get that insight. So... I don't have a whole lot of thoughts on the CPI. I, uh, I'm pretty content with it. I um, think it's really good for, for me when I'm filling it out for self-assessment. And then uh, you know, making sure, a lot of times, Don and I have already kind of discussed a lot of parts about the CPI before I'm even putting it in and before I see his feedback. So they tend to really align very well. So yeah, I don't really have uh, many critiques on it. I'm fine with it. I think uh, the biggest strength of the CPI is it is, you know, students and then clinical instructors is that, you know, we get to fill out everything independently first. 
before you kind of see the other's assessment. And I found that really challenging for the first, you know, two times with both of my clinical instructors on rotations, you know, filling that out. You know, I, I really had to, to self-assess and, and, you know, kind of wonder, you know, how far off am I? Uh, and I think the biggest strength there is that that opens up a dialogue between you and the clinical instructor to kind of see, you know, if you're on the same page or if, if you know, you're off by a little bit, you know, maybe if you, you talk about a certain patient case, you know, maybe you're, you know, closer to each other than you think, but you're just kind of grading on some, some different scales. So I really like that aspect as kind of a, a dialogue opener and communicator between student and CI. Uh, I found that having to fill out something in the text boxes ahead of time uh, was was more tedious, and, and I didn't personally get a lot of, of reward there. Um, I got the most reward from the conversations back and forth, you know, after looking at how, you know, each of us in this partnership kind of assessed my performance versus trying to, you know, guess ahead and, and fill out those boxes. So I think the best strength is – is that it's you know, a dialogue opener, and and I got the most reward after the scores had been submitted, instead of you know sitting down on the front end. Absolutely, and and Don, I I'd like to kind of pose the same question, and even kind of ask because I know that some people, um, I've heard a couple of critiques on the CPI, and I always just kind of wonder when I think of the CPI, I'm like, is it the actual instrument? Is it the actual consistent utilization, and you know, making sure we're consistent with using it, and are we doing it right? Like. This is kind of something I always think about when I kind of hear those critiques. So I'd love to kind of know where you stand on this issue. It reminds me of an Albert Einstein quote, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. I personally think that you're, you're asking for a subjective assessment uh, from a CI, you know, based on their student. And so I, I feel like there's maybe some added level of complexity that may be unnecessary. I'm not real familiar with the evidence behind the CPI, but I think that Sometimes I feel like when I'm filling you know, out the, the, the bar graph and I'm typing in things that there's a lot of redundancy between different items. And so I feel like I'm always kind of rushing to get down to the last one, which is, you know, what are the students' strengths? What are the students' areas of, uh, that need to be improved? You know, would you say that this student is ready to take on a full caseload in your practice? Like, are they ready? And then do you have any other advice for them? Uh, so I... I, I'm, I'm in favor of simplifying the CPI. I think it's fine the way it is, but if there's any way that we can simplify, just like I think that uh, questionnaires for our patients, you know, subjective questionnaires, I think that they need to be simplified. Uh, I think that if we could get those things down from, you know, 20 and 30 and 40 questions to like one to three to five, uh, I, I think that we need to simplify these processes um, because it's already, um, you know, arduous or kind of laborious enough that, you know, like, for example, one of them that I've talked to other CIs about that kind of frustrates me is cultural competency. If you're a graduate student, you're a doctoral level physical therapy student, and you don't have cultural competency, you know, you can't interact with people of a different ethnicity or a different, different culture with a, a non-judgmental, respectful way, then should you be in graduate school? How did you get here? And if you can't do that, then how are you possibly going to be a practitioner? And so there's, there's some things like if, if you can't do that, that's a red flag. Uh, so I, I, I think that I'm, I'm oftentimes just trying to rush towards the end and get to that sort of free text box and say, you know, what are these person's strengths and weaknesses? And, uh, you know, what is the plan of action to help them get, get through that? For sure. And it, it's, certainly a big, it's certainly a big topic because I know we've had a few people on to discuss the CPI specifically, and you know, learning more about that, it's really kind of interesting how the complexity of it and how it was all formed, and it's certainly enlightening to say the least. But I think your points on there, you know, to kind of make things simple, certainly seems to hold value because I know that's a common thing I've heard from other CIs as well. And, and Don, I know this next question could probably be a whole separate podcast of itself, um, but I, I'd be really curious to kind of gather your insight and your transformation on how you've really changed and grown as a CI from when you started being a clinical instructor and kind of what are your aspects of clinical education or clinical instruction are you currently still working on and really refining at this time? Sure. So right now I've been reading this book called Second Mountain, The Second Mountain by David Brooks. And I would say that the first few students that I 
that I took as a CI that I was still on my first mountain, which is a, a metaphor for representing my own self-interests, that I looked at the student as they were there to serve me or serve our patients. Uh, that they were, you know, kind of part of the support staff. And so I would say about my third student is when I had a student who made a really big commitment. She took a big risk. Uh, her name was Maral Javadafar, and she left Queens, New York, uh, where she had spent her whole life in the five boroughs. Uh, she played college basketball. She was at New York Medical College, and she took this big risk, and she moved to Southside, Virginia, in a town called Chatham of 1,500 people where she came to be my student for three months. She had never lived rurally. She had never lived outside of the big city. And she took this huge risk, made this big commitment, moved all the way down here. Her parents were scared for her. Uh, she, she had, she had uh, a, a, just a great openness and, and honesty and a willingness to learn. And she just would say all the time, she'd say, I'm just happy to be here. And it was her energy. It was her spirit. It was her... Uh, willingness to put herself in a foreign, uncomfortable situation um, that really helped me to transition from a, a first mountain kind of perspective to a second mountain perspective that Brooks talks about is, you know, being other centered, you know, focused on being self-giving. And that's where I started to really evolve and change and recognize that these students aren't here for me. I'm here for these students. And so one of the things that I've, I've already aforementioned that I love to do, and I did this with both Lauren and Joe, was I would tech for them. You know, if they had two patients in a row, I'd love to kind of step into the room and say, hey, your next one's here. What can I do? You know, put them in a situation where they have to multitask and they have to, you know, finish up with one person and have another one get going or, you know, clean up after them in the room. Because that, that's my responsibility as a second mountain uh, you know, kind of person dedicated to the others in my life that I want to take what knowledge and skills and abilities that I've cultivated on my first mountain of self-creation and self-transformation. And I want to be able to devote that to those around me because ultimately when it's all said and done, you know, what is a successful life? It's uh, the people that were closest to me, you know, my, my, my family, my friends, my students, do they love and respect me? That's what I'm looking for you know, at the end of my life. And so it's hard to love and respect someone who's uh, completely dedicated to themselves. And so I, I think having that, that third student, Maral, she really helped me to, uh, to, to kind of make that transition. And it was, it's been a beautiful journey. And I, I you know, I, I still love celebrating in her successes. Uh, she recently, about two months ago, was hired into the NFL as one of the first uh, female coaches uh, ever in the NFL. Not that I think it's a, it's a female thing because I think she's an excellent practitioner, but I love this idea that she's a strength and conditioning coach for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And she's getting to exercise her skill set at the top of her scope of practice. And she's getting to do something that not many people get to do. So I love to celebrate this journey that, that she is on. And we talk on a very regular basis. And uh, it has been such a transformative experience for me to be a CI. That's why I don't understand when a lot of my colleagues, uh, they, they don't understand why I select or I, I elect to be a student, uh, excuse me, a CI uh, so regularly. And they talk poorly about being a clinical instructor. I just don't understand it because I've gotten so much value out of uh, both my students when they've been, you know, in tandem with me in practice, but then much further out is to, you know, maintain contact and relationships with them. So, um, yeah, it's been a, been a beautiful journey to transition from sort of more of a, a self-centered approach to an other centered approach. And, I think uh, I have a lot to to thank my my previous students for that. You know, it's funny. It sounds so simple and so obvious when you say that, but I, it, I can only imagine, like you had kind of alluded to with the um, quote and the analogy, it's like literally like a mountain. Like it's just so different when you're actually doing it in the real thing. Because I I can only imagine, you know, that perception that you have and kind of that experience and how that is. So I think that's a really important you know, point to bring out. You know, Brandon. Uh, David Brooks, he says, you know, in, in his book, he says, everybody says you should serve a cause larger than yourself, but nobody tells you how. And I think that's just a, so it's a wonderful kind of thought. It's a wonderful statement because it's true. You know, we all kind of know that, 
you know, you're around somebody special when their message is bigger or greater than, than themselves, than the messenger. But no one tells you, hey, fall in love with this thing. And in fact, I think that's just not how it works. Like, I don't think someone can tell you to fall in love with this or that. I knew from a young age when I was still a freshman, maybe even a sophomore, 18, 19 year, years old in college, that I was, uh, I was a teacher. That inside, deep inside of me, there was this teacher that needed to get out. And I remember one of the first books that I fell in love with was called The Courage to Teach by Parker Palmer. He's one of my very, very favorite thinkers and writers about education and about uh, transformation and about living a, a kind of a whole life. And so, you know, that was almost, you know, Brooks talks about kind of recommitting your life to a concept. So once I got through my academic degrees, I've always kind of adjuncted at various schools at different levels. I've taught strength and conditioning. I've taught athletic training. And now I teach in a physical therapy program. But, you know, what I, what I did was made a recommitment to being a teacher. And I decided that not only can I see a full-time patient caseload, but I'm going to do this while I contemporaneously teach a young person to learn how to do this themselves. And so it, it actually it doubles my reward uh, and, and the satisfaction of going to work every day because now we get to help patients better than I could do by myself. The quality of care that Joe and Lauren and I have been able to, to provide over the last six months is just absolutely wonderful. And I've been able to learn and I've been able to, to grow personally. So it's really amazing and beautiful how when you make this transition to an other-centered life uh, – that and, and make it from a very genuine place and do it in a way that is uniquely resonates with you, who you are, that it really is a, is a beautiful thing. So this CI piece is just, it's, it's a big part of who I am. And I know that's not going to be for everybody. Uh, and I'm not saying that everyone needs to take students here around or, or whatever, but I, I, I think that you need to find that thing that resonates with you and, and be maximally committed to it. No, I mean, that's, that's very strong advice. And I think one thing to add to that is I think it's really remarkable is how not only when you're doing your work, you're not only just treating and helping patients and students, but think how many more patients you're actually helping because of as a result of training your students as well. I mean, that just exponentially increases. So that's, I mean, that's great that the impact that that can have is from so many different avenues. And, you know, everyone, I, we always like to kind of finish up and wrap up every episode with kind of this last big question. Now, this does not need to be clinical education specific. This can be about anything that was either talked about tonight or even something totally different that's unrelated because we believe this is probably one of our, our biggest questions. And of course, the question is, if you could change one aspect of healthcare education, now whether that be physical therapy or otherwise, which aspect would you change and how would you change it? And Don, let's start with your thought, with your answer on this one, because this is a big question. I would make it more interdisciplinary. I would integrate programs and I would integrate faculty and I would integrate some of the fundamental sciences like anatomy and physiology. And I would have as many disciplines as possible in one setting. I think that part of the divide or the divisions that we have and silos that we have in practice start in academia because AT faculty aren't talking to PT faculty or there aren't, you know, uh, educational institutions that are cult creating a culture of, of interdisciplinary function and interaction. So I, I wish that as an undergraduate, as a strength and conditioning major, I wish that I had had more classes with athletic trainers. I wish that I had a better understanding of what athletic training was at that time and vice versa. Uh, I wish that in PT school that I had more uh, cross paths, more with physiatrists, uh, with OTs, with orthopedic surgeons. I wish that there was just more collaborative and interdisciplinary discussion because I think there would be a lot more respect and appreciation for what each other does well outside of school. But uh, in the real world, from a kind of a, a practitioner looking into the ivory tower, from what I see, even the faculty uh, of different healthcare disciplines are not collaborating and talking to each other very often. There's only a, a select few institutions that I know of that really harbor and uh, create a, uh, a culture of, uh, of interdisciplinary collaboration, even in publication or just in the classroom. So that would be my emphasis. I find that to be very exciting. I love the idea of the anatomy lab being a place where multiple healthcare disciplines can all get together and study together and learn from each other and respect one another for what they bring to the table. 
Yeah, and ironically, Don, that is one of our most common responses that we get to that question. That's actually our third most common. So I think that's really interesting that you brought that up. And, you know, I'd love to kind of hear your students' perspective now, especially being relatively newer to the profession a little bit. I'd love to kind of hear, Lauren, so what, if you could change one thing about education, what would you change and how would you change it? So my thoughts are actually very similar to Dawn's, um, just more of an intermingling of, of healthcare students before we even graduate. Um, however, South College did attempt to do this. We had a, a sort of in-service with, I believe it was just PA and pharmacy students. Joe, you can correct me on that. There may have been nursing, I recall exactly, but um, it was about two hours where all of the students from physical therapy, PA, pharmacy, we all got into one room and um, there was a patient scenario and there was a PT student from our group that was elected to um, kind of be a part of that. And there was students from each discipline elected to be a part of that whole scenario. And um, after it all went down, uh, we had a group discussion about it. And a very common thing that the other discipline said about physical therapy is that they're like, wow, I didn't realize y'all spent so much time with the patient and y'all did such thorough evaluation. And um, so I thought that was really cool. It seemed like they had really changed their perspective of our profession and what we do. Absolutely. And I think it's been really good to see kind of how South College by itself has also kind of really started and how it's transformed to what it is now, because I mean, it's just such a such an innovative model. And I think that's certainly promising. And I think I like that, it's, you know, they're incorporating this among many other awesome avenues to really help enrich that educational experience for their students. So I love hearing that. So Joe, last but certainly not least, if you could change one thing about healthcare education, what would you change and how would you change it? Now, this is something that I've at least seen a little bit with our program at South College. And I promise this is not a shameless plug for my clinical instructor. Uh, my CPI is already done, so that's official. But the class that Don actually led was a mindfulness course. And there was a lot of carryover with the coursework that I had in my master's education at UT on things like metacognition, stress and arousal management, attentional focus, things that help the practitioners interact, you know, on a better level with the patients. You know, I don't think that there's a lack for you know, physiology and anatomy and those kinds of, you know, discrete testable things in our education. But how do we actually interact with the people that we have in front of us? Uh, motivational interviewing, uh, those kind of, of, you know, harder to teach skills that you can't just put into, you know, a multiple choice test answer, but that are necessary for us to carry out, you know, and, and implement all this knowledge that we have. So from what I've seen, this is a direction that we're moving into. Uh, I hope it becomes more and more mainstream as education continues to progress. Well, I love that. And I think that's something with talking with a lot of educators and a lot of other people on this podcast, that has certainly been um, a topic that has been brought up quite a few times. And from what I'm hearing from at least a few schools, at least, and through the grapevines, that that is starting to be more prevalent. So I am very optimistic about that. But, you know, I want to just first and foremost, thank you all for your time good to kind of share your insight on a lot of these topics. I think I mean, I've definitely learned and thought about things a little differently kind of after hearing all of your responses, especially regarding, you know, learning clinical education and just clinical um, instruction in particular. So, for, so thank you all for, you know, coming on and for sharing your insights. Um, but I recognize that there might be some listeners out there that perhaps uh, want to learn more, kind of want to find out more about these topics or, maybe even want to go so far as to kind of reach out to y'all should they have a question. Um, so where can people um, find out a little bit more or reach out should they have a question? Well, my email is uh, my name, Don Reagan at gmail.com. Uh, I'm also on, I guess, the main social media platforms. And so I uh, w would appreciate and welcome any uh, collegial interaction uh, from anyone interested in uh, anything that uh, that I shared tonight. So happy to help. Uh, yeah, so same uh, as Dawn. I have a Gmail account. Uh, mine's actually with my maiden name. So it's Lauren, L-A-U-R-E-N-P-E-R-S-Y-N at gmail.com. So that's Lauren Persyna G. Um, I'm also, I probably mostly on Instagram. I'm not, I don't really get on Facebook as much anymore. Um, however, I do still receive messages from there. So if anyone messes me on there, I probably would. Um, currently Instagram, Lauren underscore shrank underscore SPT. 
Um, I guess this time next week, I'll probably change it to DPT. And I am not a big social media guy. I have tried it and spectacularly failed. But email is the easiest and best way to get a hold of me. And my email address is jdhope, D-E-H-O-P-E, at gmail.com. Well, excellent. And thank you all so much again for coming on this evening and chatting. It's been a pleasure having you all on, and I wish you all the best of luck in your next avenues of your professional careers. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare, which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.